Hey everybody, today we are in Clinton, South Carolina at the Battle of Musgrove Mill State Historic Site. So this weekend they are having their Living History Weekend, so we decided we're going to come check out a little bit of it before we head somewhere else. We came a few years ago, we absolutely loved what we saw. So, are you ready to do yep. it again? Alright, so let's go. So this shows the schedule of events for this weekend. First of all, we're going to come over here where they're going to be firing some guns off so we can see that and then we'll walk around a little bit. No, this is for the video right now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Musgrove Field and our first firing demonstration. We'll be doing uh, just going through the, the manual of loading and firing uh, the weapons here. We have most of them are rifles. Uh, we do have maybe a musket or two out there. Um, what's that? Is that a musket? Brown bass. Ah. So brown best musket. Uh, don't know who knows the difference in a rifle and a musket. Yes, sir. Life and smooth board. Right. And the difference. You know what? What difference that makes? The accuracy. Accuracy. Distance. Distance. But also with the musket is speed. A good musketeer or musketman or soldier can load and fire this three times, maybe four times in a minute, because he's not having to jam that ball down through the, the rifle. Now he can fire a lot, but it's not nearly as accurate. Rifle here, one to two times a minute, but it's very slow because you're driving that ball through the rifle. So when he shoots, it's coming out, for a modern analogy, like a football, it's spiraling. Very accurate, very long range, killing distance, maybe up to 400 yards if you're that good. This one, your killing distance is gonna be less than 100 yards, accurately 50 yards. So the musket's about volume, the rifle's about accuracy. We'll be loading and firing both. You won't notice the difference here because clearly we won't be loading uh, musket balls. Uh, on the frontier where we are now, you would have had both. Generally, the household needed a rifle. It's for hunting, it's for providing food, protecting the family. But we're in the 1780s now and a lot of these gentlemen, if they're, if they're older than 30 years old or, or pushing 40, they fought for the king against the French in the Seven Years' War. So they were issued at that point the king's arm, the musket, brown best musket, and they kept them as militia for the king. So they are armed by the king and now fighting the king. So we have those two style weapons. So we'll go through the loading and the firing of these uh, afterwards. Uh, we'll open it up for questions for all these gentlemen if you want to Come forward after we do that. You guys want to return to your rank? Um, again, what we'll be doing is militia, and there was a wide range. There were very well trained militia. Gentlemen, shoulder your firelocks to the right about face. There were ragtag militias that came along. They didn't fight very well, so most militias had were trained, but at, and drilled some in just different levels. If you had a, a gentleman that was uh, very proud landowner that was and generally it was the, 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 the landowners and the gentry that armed and paid for the militia.
militia. Uh, they would have been well drilled. These guys, I think, are pretty well drilled. Hmm. Prime and load. So that's the command where they, you see they're going to their cartridge box, they're pulling out a cartridge. It's a piece of rolled paper with gunpowder in it. Oh, sure one end you've got fart. a ball. You want to get it when they fart? Mm -hmm. uh, at the other end, it's, it's twisted. So they'll bite that off. They'll put powder in their pan. What they've done is they'll cast it about, pour the rest of the powder down the uh, barrel. If they had a ball on there, which they do not, they would pull the rammers out and ram that down. We don't pull the rammers out for demonstrations for safety reasons. This would have been, again, the method for loading and firing. We get this question a lot for militia. Uh, if you're hunting, it's a whole different setup. You're not using the cartridge, you're using a powder horn and things. Company bake, ready? Baking! Fire! You guys are actually pretty lucky. You've heard two really good volleys, and the definition of a volley is all the muskets firing and firing at the same time. And after we do this, you'll get to see. But I, if you're not familiar with the flintlock, like I told you, they they are putting gunpowder in a little pan. Hey, dude! Hi! Bigger budget this year, four shots. <laughs> and again, that was another really good volley. You never know. You never know. To the right about face. Uh -oh. no. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the militia of Musgrove Mill. That's that's all the firing that we're going to do. I would encourage you. You've got I don't know close to twenty gentlemen here that are experts in American history in the backcountry and the weaponry and their clothing. Come on forward and ask questions. And gentlemen, if you want to come forward and talk to these folks, you learn a lot from these guys. Uh, so please feel free to, to engage. Come on up, fellas. <laughs> also, just to let everybody know, the next firing is at 12.30, and the last one for the day is at 3 o'clock. And in about oh, this is a 10 minutes, yes, if any kids want to join the militia, this is the standard this is musket used by the British during the uh, American Revolution. So just come on Actually, over this is the second model. Question. The first model was four inches longer, and this one replaced the second model during the American Revolution. So if you're talking about the French and Indian War, same weapon, only four inches longer, a little bit longer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, what you did not see, what we didn't do for safety reasons, is that when, the, when we put the powder in, in the weapon, the bullet is almost as big a diameter as the barrel. So, and also the bullet is usually wrapped in a piece of cloth or paper called wadi. In the case of these cartridges, you wrap the bullet in that paper. That paper serves as a gasket so you have a tight fit. And what you see when they're doing this is the bullet is too big a diameter to go all the way down into the chamber of the weapon. So you're actually packing the bullet down into the breech of the weapon. And then when you got her down in there, then this is pulled out. 
Because if you just drop the loose ball down there, and then you had aim at a target down there, your bullet's going to roll out the end of the barrel. And fall out the the yeah, that's... We, said, we said that you could do four rounds in a minute. Three. Now, that, that's under several conditions. Number one is that you have a prepackaged cartridge. Now, I towed a, a ram or a, a um, powder horn. So my powder would be in here, and the bullets would be in a bag in here. And so if you're hunting, you know, you pull this out, the powder is loose. This is a measure. You measure out exactly the right amount. Put that back in. Okay, the cartridge that you saw is a pre-measured amount of powder and the bullet tied up together. So you, you can only do the three rounds a minute if you have this pre-packaged cartridge. The second is you have to avoid all the modern safety regulations that they make us follow so we don't have the kind of horrific accidents that they had back then. Because um, there will only be one in South Carolina State Parks, and that will be the one that ends the entire program. Okay, so, and you know, the odds are that, you know, look how many people are out here with, with their own cell phones and recording devices. So, guarantee that horrible accident will be on YouTube long before we can get that person to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And we're not unique. We follow the standards that were developed by the National Park Service, which almost every historic site nationwide, be it state parks, be it uh, private museums, tend to follow the National Park Service standards. Which, and, and so if, if there's any mistakes we make, it's in being overly cautious. And some of the things you look at and you think, well, maybe that is a little overly cautious, but again, we don't want anybody getting hurt, and we certainly don't want it documented and on YouTube. <laughs> Not only for that person's you know, health and, and safety, but you know, but, I have a question concerning the fire fire in three a minute. Yes, sir. Um, you got a fire in your barrel. Uh, it's, how do you ensure that there's no sparks you don't. in there? You, you don't. have a premature... Emphasis on you can't do it and follow modern safety precautions. You, that is a problem. Now, when we're doing demonstration, or, or let's just say you're hunting, um, and you want to make darn sure there's no fire in there. Yeah. Well, one good way to do that is to blow it out, which means wrap your mouth around the, 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 the blow, and, and when there's no longer smoke coming out the, the touch hole, you know that the sparks out. That's another picture we don't want on YouTube for obvious reasons. <laughs> so here's something that probably wasn't done back then, but works and looks good, and if it's photographed, it's not a bad thing. If you see a little bit of smoke coming out of the touch hole, which is where the, the fire from the pan goes through the end of the barrel. Of the you know, you've heard of smoking gun. Well, those touch holes are fine for a while. You'll see smoke drifting out of that touch hole for a while, and that's probably because there may still be a spark in there. Well, what you can do to encourage that spark to burn out, pull your rammer and fan the flame. And you, you see here, you fan it, you fan it, you fan it. And if somebody photographs this on YouTube, that doesn't look bad. <laughs> and you can blow the, the charge out. Now keep in mind... There's your spark. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> 
Which <laughs> yep. It ain't it don't quick. Better not be in a hurry. Alright. Any questions? Y'all have a great day. Everybody see our tinder box yes, here on the table? You wanna look at the tinder box on the table? You can look at the tinder. Just make sure you don't cut yourself or anything. It's a tinder box. <laughs> and you burn it in the fire, you get it hot, and, and right before it flames up, you put a, you got it in the can in there with a hole. So that'll catch your spark. And this is uh, coconut husk. That's natural material. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, he took it out of his wife's basket. Yeah, don't tell him. <laughs> You ain't got yours, Abby. I do. Hmm? I do. It's in my bag over there. Okay. It was sparking good to start with. Yeah, it's just my little chocolate. Huh? There it is. Okay, you got you got spark. That's all it takes, that little spark. <coughs> One thing you don't do while you're doing this is inhale. <laughs> don't burn your hands. Oh, you can do you. that. Ooh, wow. <laughs> there you go. You can hardly even Although see that. Three ingredients. <laughs> Three ingredients. Fuel. Air. Air. Heat. heat. Exactly. So that's the heat. Fuel. Where do you get the air from? <laughs> And blow it. What do you What do you do to put out a fire? Cool it, smother it, <laughs> smother it. You remove one of those ingredients, yeah. right? If you take away the heat or the uh, fuel <coughs> or the oxygen, you can put it out. Mm -hmm. You see our little tinder box? That's a cute little box. You can look in it. <coughs> or get, let that gentleman <coughs> hand it to that man right there. And let him look in it. That's Thank a little tender, that's our tender box. That's where we keep all the tender. <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> yes, sir. And this is little grooves and lands in it and makes the bottle spin. Okay, if you notice, there's a big difference in the hole size. I'm not going to point it. That's to allow this to be loaded very quickly. Okay, I can load this three to four times a minute. This one takes about a minute. So if you're shooting at me with this one, you got three or four shots, and I only got one. So on the battlefield, this was a lot more efficient. If you're standing over there at that white tent and I shoot this, how long would it take you to get from that white tent to me if you were really in a hurry and had a lot of adrenaline and was as young as those guys were back then, 20, 30 year olds? Mm -hmm. You could be here before I get this one loaded. That's why, like at the Battle of Kings Mountain, they would fire these. And then run and hide down behind a tree and reload and then come back up and fire it again. So, um, this is actually a 36 caliber. Whereas this one is a 70 caliber. It's twice as big. And they would actually load these with what they call buck and ball. They would let the ball go down, then they would add buckshot on top of it. And shoot it. Wouldn't want to be in front of that. And the buckshot was probably about as big as the balls in this thing. So they'd be four or five of them plus a round ball. You ever hear expression flash in the pan? You hear that? That's the pan. So when the flint hits the prison, it causes a spark and flashes in the pan. You ever hear the expression lock, stock, and barrel? We, uh, we, we was on the road the other day with locking down. <laughs> oh, were you? That's about a 69 caliber ball. That's 36. And, I mean, why wouldn't you want this and that? Because if you hit a squirrel with this, blow it apart. You, <laughs> you clean it while you shoot it. And also, it's expensive. I mean, I can make. Two or three of these out of that ball right there. 
And each rifle is custom made, so there's none of them exactly the same. So each rifle you have a ball mold designed for that rifle. Whereas these, all they had to be is close. Yeah. Well, these are, I'm representing the surgeon here for the um, day. And uh, some people say, well, how'd you train for that? Did you have a school for that? Never went to school for it at all. I've been a apprentice for about six years under a practicing surgeon. Maybe when I was a young man, if I showed particular interest or um, ability in the medical field, then uh, my parents, if they were financially able enough, would uh, pay or make some kind of deal with a local surgeon. And I could train under him for about six years, typically. And at the end of that time, I'd learn what he learned, uh, dealing with patients, making medicines, what the instruments are for, how they're used, when they're used, that sort of thing. And at the end of that six years, he would take out a piece of paper, his quill, pen, and ink, and he would write what was known as a certificate of proficiency, it was called. And that was my license to practice. There was no American Medical Association, no governing authority of any of this. So the medicines you used, you made yourself, um, according to recipes, you had your tools made, or uh, you could purchase tools um, as well, and then set up and you'd be a, a surgeon. Uh, and if you claim to be, then by golly you must be, because <laughs> nobody can prove you're not. Yeah. Uh, there were quacks too, of course you can imagine, they were quacks, they would run them out of town some. These instruments here uh, are for amputations, I could do that. Tooth extractions, okay. instruments here for that. Uh, these are a variety of instruments here, cranial surgery, scalpels, uh, re skin retractors, bleeding pan, lancets. So most anything that was bothering you, I could make a stab at it. No pun intended. <laughs> These things right here, yeah. uh, these are called leather retractors, and if you're going to do an amputation, <clears throat> you'll take the amputation knife, and the, uh, I'll get that in just a second, but this is, this is first. This is a sharp portion of the blade here, this is an original one, take it back to the Revolutionary War time. But the thing was, you did, you wanted to do amputations quickly, particularly after battles, because you had a lot of soldiers. So one quick cut to the bone here, one quick cut up this way to the bone. All right. So you cut through all the flesh, all the muscle tissue to the bone. Then you have to retract back that skin and muscle tissue from the bone to leave enough bone to saw through. So that's what this is for. If my finger represents my arm bone, this is inserted in the cut and when you pull the tractor back, it pulls back the skin and muscle. Back this way. Then you can use the amputation knife, I'm sorry, amputation saw, which is here. A few strokes of this, you saw through the limb. And as it sits on like Mr. Presswell here, <laughs> would. It's on the floor. That would be too. He'd take that, that arm or leg and he would take it back somewhere in this, back behind the pit, place it with the others, and they'd be buried in the pit later. But then I continued to deal with veins and arteries, closing those, sewing them back together, making a nice stunt. And his teeth would catch on these little serrations here on top and bottom, and then as soon as they catch, you open his mouth like this, and he's caught like a fish. <laughs> and you can't pull it out because these, the, the sweep of these things, you can't pull it out of the mouth. The only way to relieve it is to back off of the thumb screw like so. And then you can get in there and you can take out that bad tooth. Uh, I know. <laughs> I need that shot in that mouth, don't you? <laughs> but of course, it, we're looking at painful... Oh, yeah. procedures any of these things are. Oh, yeah. um, 
So people most often time ask, what do you use for pain? Was there anything to give you for pain? And there was. And the best thing to give you, it was called laudanum. Yeah. Uh, and it contained water and sugar and honey and herbs and wine and opium, which was the key ingredient. And it wasn't that it, that it, that it, hey Jesse, good to see you, doing good to see you there. Oh, there's the horse. We're the cavalry and we come in late all the time. There you go. Yes, sir. If you're just in time. That's right. <laughs> Uh, any of these procedures help sedate you. Not that it relieved pain that much, but it just made you Not uh, down, sleepy, little. take away some nervousness, that sort of thing. And I'd make this up myself. Money. Back then, we didn't have money like we do now. Well, England didn't want to keep too much money. How did you get that just a Or it depended on them. So people used different names like that. Calling the opportunity, they grew a lot of tobacco, so they paid off people off in tobacco. And here, deer skins and things, that's what you get from a dollar a book. So like the mill here, you go down and get drunk stuff ground in the mill, you didn't pay him in money, you gave him part of your corn. Another thing, a lot of the bargain in the mill, right? Uh, one thing that was universal around here was a Spanish dollar, a doubloon. They could break it off and it was good, you had to bloom it, it was good in France or England, uh, Germany, anywhere. So they break off pieces of it. It's a piece of bait. Uh huh. You hear about fire. And one piece is about, uh, about 12 cents. Four, about 12 cents. Two pieces is about a quarter. Four pieces would be uh, 50 cents. Six pieces would be 75 cents. And eight pieces would be a dollar. So two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar. All for whoever school you for to stand up and hold. Uh -huh. you know, so whenever the, I also watch a lot of guns, they did two bits. Mm -hmm. well, you just That's how they did the money, right? Yeah. Right. Set up right. Hang on now in England, they had yeah. a, a guinea, a gold guinea. You wouldn't find too many of these in America. Uh -huh. Might be some oil governor or some big shot like that. They had a crown, this would be like a dollar. They had a half crown. And he had a, a, a shilling. And this is a sixpence, about like six cents. Uh -huh. And then the rest of the thing, you might find copper over here. And a different thing. This is a farling right here. These are half pennies. This is a farling, that's the cheapest, the lowest thing. And we always hear about old, oh, oh, something old, oh, bigger coming up. So you got a cup of copper you can eat in hand, that's what you get. And America started making, during the revolution, started making printing money. And they didn't really have nothing to back it up for foreign trade. They made different denominations, they had a six of a dollar. Right at first, this was pretty good money, but when they started more like eight years, they started losing battles and things like that. Got where it wasn't worth nothing. And England also was making counterfeit sending over here. Uh -huh. Got where it wasn't worth East of the colonies also kind of used some money too, but it was always paper money. So after a while, it wasn't worth nothing. If you had South Carolina paper money, it might be worth all right in North Carolina, but to go up for no. It was worthless. They move us in the ride on trade and stuff. Money, like we think of money now, very scarce. Uh huh. What's your food? Stew. Stew. We've got chicken and potatoes and carrots. 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 What else in there? That's uh, chicken, carrots, potatoes, and corn. Okay. okay. Oh, that sounds, mm, that sounds amazing. You're probably going to end up trying that. <laughs> I would if he'd let me. <laughs> what you got in the little pot? 
biscuits. He's heating the biscuits. <laughs> That's made out of a piece of round iron, 13 inches long. That's a lot of stretching. These, these are 40. Huh? We were just talking about someone who would want that. Yeah. I had a fella come over one year. He was a contractor. And, uh, he came to one of the shows and he bought one. He got the card and everything, and I didn't really think much more about it. And about two weeks before Christmas, he called and he says, uh, we had the gang together all the employees, and we had a state cookout. And he was using that thing, and everybody was making all of that thing. So he said, uh, can you make the 28 by Christmas? Oh. <laughs> it takes four to five hours, easy. With all the new equipment, power hammers and stuff. So I had a little oh, busy Christmas that year. <laughs> but but he had a lot of hair for his lawyer. Yeah, he sure did. That is so Well, they're fun to make. Yeah. It keeps me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's making one there, but it won't be planted or anything because I come out home and yeah, my branch brushes are done. <laughs> Just, oh, it's very cool. That's what they look like before I do the planish and, and green stuff. Pretty It looks like um something that turned it. Look, mm -mm. I can't smell it. Those are aniseeds, so they have a licorice smell. Oh. Sunny? Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> winter, oh, I've never smelled it. Before. Winter spice. It is used in eggnog, if that helps. No, I don't drink no. eggnog. <laughs> it's nutmeg. Oh, nutmeg. Okay. That smells kind of nutty. I don't know. We are not doing good at this, are we? <laughs> I got, I use spice, it's got names on it. <laughs> I don't know what that is either. Molasses. Oh, okay. What? Molasses. Molasses. We have failed the test, I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's okay. So, any questions about anything? She's got ginger cake, cracknels. Crack Crack Knolls. Crack. It's a weird name, but it's just a light, uh, flavorless cookie, and I flavored them with the aniseeds. So oh. It tastes like licorice. 
Want to try some? Only a dollar piece. Mm -hmm. You got a dollar? I got some money, yeah. so I can know when and where I am. Um, they're built together. You know, you know why they'd be built together? Because the, it only works when, it's, when the tower is pointed. No, the tower's got to be uh -huh. pointed due north. Okay. Okay, so you have to sight your, your uh, sundial. Of course, it's pretty useless today. Um, but that would have been the main timepiece used in this time period. Mm -hmm. The bigger they are, the more accurate they are. This one is actually accurate to within about 20, 30 minutes. Which is respectable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't want to set the DVR by it, but you know, if you tell somebody I'll be there around three, this will get you there at around three. Okay. Um, Maybe that's where that saying came from. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but, but but when you've got one this big, it's accurate to within a minute or so. You get one bigger and bigger, can be accurate within seconds. Uh -huh. so, um, and by the way, this is the main timepiece of the time. The guy who suggested daylight savings time was Benjamin Franklin. It was a joke. The joke doesn't translate well to modern times because we use clocks. Uh -huh. But he suggested we'll just, well, the only clock there was was the big one in the town square. Everybody else for their personal, at a sun, how the heck are you supposed to set that back? Yeah. It was a joke. But somebody took him seriously. Oh, there you go. And um, you, you know that, that there's local time which means that, for instance, if you went from here to the coast to Charleston, Charleston's about 20 minutes ahead of us in local time. The whole idea of time zones uh -huh. is a 19th century thing that they had to adopt when they not only had watches, but they had railroads and the trains had to run on time. But this is before all of that, so. Yeah, because we went to a um, train museum in Aiken and they have a thing you can press and it said who invented time zones and it was the railroads. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And then you say that two days later after I heard it. <laughs> yeah. um, but this will give you a good general idea of what local time is mm -hmm. when it's bright and sunny. Yep. And he's already told me all, all about that gun. I know. That, the musket. The tower folds down. Okay. So the lid folds on top right. of it. And then you can tell it in your pocket. Oh, that's cool. That's what you call a remote. Portable. Portable. Portable remote. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. Technical. It's a mouse axe. Because it's, it's tiny. Small. small. This is a half size one. I'm old and fat and I don't want to tote a full size. Uh -huh. uh, and by the way, you know why this is not a tomahawk? Because the word tomahawk has changed meaning at time. The word tomahawk 200 years ago meant hammer. So a true tomahawk has a hammer head on this side of it. If it doesn't have a hammer head, it's a belt axe. It's called a belt axe because it's stuck down inside the belt. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. And we have a little... better tool for this, but I left it in another basket, so I'm, I'm trying. As long as it works, that's all it matters. <laughs> I'm going to go die. I got something in the pot. It's been in there repeatedly. I'm trying to get it as dark as I can. Loyalist so. or whatever it is, but then when they move to Jersey, Are you all familiar with Indigo? We've seen it. Um, What's for dinner? We haven't seen it. Have done this way before. We have not seen it done this way before. Like actually boiling and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Well, we've always seen the finished product. Oh, okay. Well, indigo starts out as a plant. Um, some people are, or some people are not familiar with that. But it's those green leaves where the mm -hmm. is. That's where the value is. Um, several um, lots of planters were growing this on their plantations prior to the Revolutionary War um, to earn okay. money, kind sure. of some of the, some the downtime mm -hmm. in the plantation. So they were not only growing it, but then you had to build a processing plant because this is how you have to sell it. Um, you don't just buy the, you know, grow the plant and sell the plant, you've got to process it to this. Um, so that's a cake of indigo. Uh, I missed you. That is, uh, this is a cake of indigo. So if you're growing it on your plantation prior to the Revolutionary War, you've got to process it to this then to be able to sell it and make money. Okay. So you don't just grow the plant. Um, but you got to process and, and it. And what do you use that for? Dyeing fabric, dyeing yarn, oh. dyeing fiber. Oh. Um, you like glue? It looks like you like glue. <laughs> 1880, if you want blue cloth, yeah. that's how you yeah. get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, indigo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very popular source of blue. 
Yeah. Yep. So I'm just um, doing a little bit of demonstrating here about using it from this point on to to get blue. You have to overcome the fact that this doesn't dissolve in water, doesn't stick to fiber. Mm. So I have to do something called reducing the vat or getting oxygen out of the water. If I can get oxygen out of the water, then all this is going to work. Um, I know the oxygen is out when I see a color change. You're looking for a little bit of yellow green. Sunlight's going differently now. It's hard yeah, to see. yeah. Um, so I put my, my fibers in, my yarns in, and it picks up that same yellow green color. And then as it works with the oxygen in the air, it turns back to blue. So a little bit of magic going on with it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that was from a gray sheet. Okay. So it picked up that slight blue color. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's more wool. It's ready to do yeah. Just, uh, going through a different phases of American history, um, at this time, would you have also used that kettle? I mean, kettles might have been scarce for cooking food in um, <laughs> We well, just had that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm doing natural dyeing, I don't want to mix a natural dye pot with a food pot. Okay. Now, would they have made that distinction? I don't know. <laughs> but I don't cook anything in a pot that I have, or utensils or things that I have used for natural dyes. So, um, indigo is kind of neat. It doesn't matter what pot I put it in. I'm not going to get a difference in color just because of the pot. But most natural dyes, if I put it in copper versus cast iron, I'm going to get two different colors. But indigo, the vessel doesn't matter. So, and I just wanted a pretty pot. Yeah. <laughs> demonstration uh, safety thing if everybody stays on this side of the fence uh, don't try to cross over even for the best picture in the world just keep on this side of the fence for everybody's safety uh, I'm gonna turn it over in just a second they're gonna uh, to uh, Alexis I'm sorry uh, and he's gonna talk a little bit about the weapons you're gonna be seeing here and some of the difference between the regulars you see in the militia uh, difference between the muskets and the rifles and then we're gonna load and fire hopefully four times for you so if you do have kids, well, you'll have a warning before they fire. So you want to put your ears, your hands over your ears. You'll be ready for that. If you have a dog, I don't really see yep. one right now. One, two. Uh, oh, in the back, just be prepared for the loud noises and frightened dogs. Yeah, hold on to your dog. Yep. Hand it over. All right. Scout, to finish what he was saying, oh. when they're getting ready to fire, you will see me put my hands over my ears. <laughs> If you have small children that don't like noise or dogs that don't like noise, hold on to them, okay? What we have here is a mix of troops. I am a, I'm a regular British officer from the 63rd Regiment of Foot. I've got my nice gorget, wearing a red coat. Our regimental colors are green. At the end, I have a provincial officer. He also has a gorget, but he's an American fighting for the crown. And a lot of Amer well, a lot of Americans fought for the crown. A lot of these guys are militia. Now you see the two guys wearing kilts. The one in the red coat is 71st Regiment of Foot Fraser's Highlanders, who were actually raised for the American Revolution and who were standing after the war. He's got a red coat and white facing, and then beside him is a Royal North Carolina Highland Regiment, which was a provincial regiment raised in North Carolina. The Highlanders of North Carolina, because there are a lot of Scotsmen living in in the Carolinas. The rest of the men are a distorted bunch of militia. And if you notice, some of them showed up kind of late in militia, you never know when they're going to show up. Uh, first, we're going to show you the brown vest. Oh, well, our park rangers are nice enough. This is the brown vest. It is a blue bore weapon. Basically, it's a giant shotgun. They were much quicker to load, much less accurate than a rifle, but they were mass produced by the British Army, and the British Army and the American Army both used them. It is a flintlock system, big rock, a piece of steel, throws sparks into the powder, and it goes off. You hope it goes off. Black powder does not like humidity, it does not like water, it does not like a whole lot of things. Now, the big advantage to that is that Brown Best took a bayonet, which you don't have one. Nope. 
Well, he's going to come up with one of our hot, the Highlanders going to show you the bayonet. When you were firing in line formation, you would usually fire one or two rounds. Then you would punch the bayonet forward and you would go in and fight with bayonets. Huzzah! If you have 300 angry British troops come at you with a pointy thing, you're going to leave. <laughs> All right, next we're going to bring a rifleman. Is there any rifleman? Rifles are exactly what you would think in modern terms. It's a barrel with rifling inside to stabilize the ball. Much slower to load, and you notice that the firing mechanism is much smaller, so it's much more finicky, it's much more delicate than a brown best would be. Now, most of these militiamen, whatever they had at the house, when they were called, that's what they grabbed. Okay, now we're going to get ready for our firing. Gentlemen, take care. That gentleman right here is going to go through them. When you see me put my hands over my ears, that's the sign that he's about to ready to fire. Watch. There was a complete drill on how to right load about. these things. Hey. Average British soldier was supposed to fire three to four rounds a minute with a rifle on the hammer and they'll flip the prison down and the spark will drop in there. Hopefully the flash will go into the barrel and hopefully set off the charge and hopefully send the ball that way. Make grenade! Take aim! That was basically a tactic that kept lead going down range for quite a while. I mean, you figure you got three, four hundred guys with one musket at a time firing. That keeps the enemy's head down. The problem is going to be if there's a misfire, then that one shot doesn't go off. Yes, prime and loaded. You have not, sir. Now, when they put them up on their shoulder, that means they are loaded unless the officer knows that they're ready to fire. Because during battle, you couldn't yell the officer to go down ready. Got other things to worry about, <laughs> and the noise level is a little. Now you see the smoke that comes out of these things. You think of you know, a couple of thousand men firing after the first couple of volleys. So everybody got you it. can't see it. Wait till the guy to your left fires, and then you fire. Bang, bang, bang. See, like old motor oil with right sticks on everything, right. it's kind of an equivalent of that, and it starts flopping. Right, you <coughs> folks came out. We are done with our fire. Okay, so we're in the car letting my phone charge up a little bit before we go back out. So, we're gonna try these cookies that we bought. I don't even know which one this is. Mm, tastes pretty good. That is good. It's got a taste that I've never tasted before. That's good. I think that was just a cracking one or something. What it called. It's got two cookies in here too. That's the ginger that we're getting ready to try.
this is our snack while we're going about. That's good too. Kind of tastes like a fruit cake in a way. I'm getting all the flavors in there. I like that. And we also bought some rosemary bread. And they were in these cute little brown paper bags. And the bread's got the twine wrapped around it. It's tied very well. Yeah. So, so far we've enjoyed watching the gun demonstrations. That's been really nice. The, um, the indigo was pretty cool because I've never seen indigo actually be in none before. So this is the rosemary bread. Oh, that's good. It's got a lot of spice in it. It's all right. It's different. Yeah. It's not like mm. anything I've ever had before. So, we're also eating this stuff like they would have ate back in the, what, 1700s? Some so got it's pretty tasty. Know, he's a living historian that's been coming here a number of years, and he is our single mounted militia, and he's going to provide a program for you here. Um, if everybody will stay where you are and nobody come any closer than this, this gentleman, if he gets caught, he's Jesse's child. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he's on the approach. does a really good job for us. If you have any questions, he'll answer them afterwards. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Kurt. I am Private Golden Tinsley of some of the local Malady Militia here. I assume you're all gathered here today to witness the aftermath of the battle that just took place. Colonels Isaac Shelby and Elijah Clark had about 200 of us militia, and we were about 40 miles away the night before. We left Smith Ford uh, at sunset last night, and along the way we got up with James Williams and some of Thomas Sumter's men. There were about 200 of us all together. We rode 40 miles through the night, uh, just stopping long enough to pick some fresh corn and peaches. The only water our horses got was in the creeks as we crossed. We were coming here to find either Ferguson or take on the garrison that was here at the Musgrove House. Now what we thought was 200 loyalist militia here, we did not know that they had been reinforced the day before with 100 more militia and 200 British provincials from New York and New Jersey. We also had ridden within four miles of Patrick Ferguson's camp last night. Didn't know that. We knew he was in the area, we just didn't know how close. But upon getting here and doing some reconnaissance, we now realize what we thought was gonna be 200 of our guys versus 200 of their militia. We we're now facing an encampment of over 500 men and Patrick Ferguson was just around the corner. We got here at sunset this morning and Shelby sent out five or six horsemen we were across the river, so he sent fires and horsemen to cross the inner reef and come up here and do some reconnaissance. Shelby and Clark went with them. They ran into a loyalist patrol and they traded fire and killed one loyalist right there on the spot. The rest of them rode back up here to warn their officers what was going on and our guys rode back to us. Now, as I say, being outnumbered almost two to one, Shelby and Clark decided that we best make fortifications. So we immediately started felling trees and gathering brush and you can almost see it just up the hill across the river. We formed a semicircle of a little bit of brushwork. Once we'd done that, all we could do was sit and wait. Now, the Tories didn't know how many of us there were, so they weren't in any hurry either. 
But I want to explain something. We had three groups, and in smaller militias too, there was no overall Patriot commander. Militias worked best when they had good leaders they trusted and if they liked the plan. So we had our plan, we had our breastworks built, and all we could do was sit and wait. Now as we heard the fife and drum approach, we knew that they were on their way. Captain Shadrach Inman sent a small group to the river to engage them at the river down here. They traded some volleys, and they would shoot a volley and back back up the hill. And they'd reload, shoot a volley, and back back up the hill, pulling the Tories up the hill towards us. Now their first volley, the Tories being, they fired at 150 yards. Now I once heard it said that to be targeted and hit with a musket at 150 yards, you were pretty unfortunate indeed. And to shoot at 200 yards, you may as well take a shot at the moon. So their first volley at 150 yards wasn't very effective. But I could hear Shelby yelling at us, don't shoot till you can see their buttons. Well, at 70 yards, we saw their buttons. And we let off a crock with our rifles and an Indian war yelp. That British Captain Delancey called us the yelling boys. I like that. When they started coming up the hill, we traded volleys back and forth until they were, it got so close it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the smoke and the fog was so thick and confusing that two of our guys on the ground grabbed a horse to, to steady it, to calm it down. Well, the problem was it was a British horse and a British officer. And he looked down and said, damn you rebels, don't you know your own officers? <laughs> now, I don't know who was more scared, our guys, the British officer or the horse, but they both ran off in different directions. As the fighting got thick, we were taking out their officers, and once the, once the officers and the leaders started to go down, the New Jersey and New York regulars started breaking and pulling back to the river. Well, when the Tory militia saw all that, they broke and ran to the river too. One of them actually stopped at the river and dropped his britches and slapped his posterior at him. One of our officers said, can't somebody turn that fellow over? I said, I can try, sir. And I lowered my rifle and dropped him, and they carried him off dead. <laughs> now, I can tell you that I've got to go on and catch up with my men. But before we stop, for tonight, we'll have ridden 100 miles in 48 hours with nothing but raw corn and peaches and just a little water on the way. But I appreciate you coming out here. Godspeed and God save the cause of liberty. Thank you. The horse's name is Buddy, and he'd be happy to stand here all day and eat. That's what he likes to do. But we'll be camped over there, and you can come pet him. He likes that too. I if you have a question, ask your question loudly so everyone can hear it. Yes, go ahead. How old is he? The horse? He's about 12 or 15 years old. We've had him for seven or eight nine years now. <coughs> yes, ma'am. The average age of the men that were with the horse here. Your, your army was about 18 to 35, uh, your, your regular army, but with being militia, uh, it, could, it could vary. I mean, it, you know, it could be as, as if, you, if you could ride a horse and carry a gun, I mean, anywhere from 13, 14 up to 45, 50, 65. I mean, if you could ride and carry a gun, you were, in the, you were, you were fit to serve. Yes, ma'am. Golden Tinsley was his name. Buried not far from here? Yes, ma'am. If, if Mr. Robert Hall is here, he can tell you exactly where he's buried. <laughs> um, yeah, he was a, he was a militia. Golden Tinsley, the, the story he told is true. Right down to the guy bearing his bottom. Um, Golden Tinsley is buried. If you go out of Cross Anchor, straight up 56, where it turns to go to Woodruff, there is, his, he was buried actually in where the Five Point Road section was moved and they moved him to the right hand side. There's a small grave with I think a fence around it and some trees in someone's front yard. But it's right on the side of the road is Golden Tinsley. His home was closer to here than that, but that is where he was buried. Yes. I wanna say something else. It might be, everybody who fought here was born in America. They either chose to fight for the Patriot side or the Whig side, as it was known then, or be a loyalist and remain true to the king. Those red coats that were here, 200 of them, those were well-trained, loyalist American citizens. That, well, they weren't, you know, they were born in America and trained by the British Army from New York and New Jersey, but they too were American-born. What? 
most of what Shelby and uh, Shadrach Inman and Elijah Clark, those guys were local militias from around the area and then even off into the Tennessee area. But they would enlist for maybe two to three months. So they had shorter enlistment and they would fight. And like, as I said, they, their enlistment was about up. They really wanted to take 96. They were gonna hit this and they really wanted to get Ferguson. But Ferguson didn't get got here, but uh, you know, Kings Mountain, we found him there. So that right there is what they had for the kids to play with. It was wooden muskets and cartridge boxes. Sorry for everybody. So welcome, my name is Mark Stanford. I'm the interpretive ranger here at the Battle of Musgrove Mill State Historic Site. I'm gonna do my talk about the battle here, uh, hopefully 45 to 50 minutes to give everybody time to see the last historic weapons firing just down here at three o'clock. So to get through it in 45 minutes, I won't be able to go through every minute detail of the battle and every individual that fought here. So we'll go over a, more of a broad, detailed history and get through the details of the battle itself. So to start off, so the battle happened here in August 19th, 1780. So we're going to go back in time just, just a little bit to get us up to the point here. How the war got here at the Battle of Musgrove Mill. So by 1779, the war has become a global war for the British. They are now fighting not just their American colonial rebels, they're fighting against the French, the Spanish, the Dutch. They're fighting in North America, they're fighting in the Caribbean, they're fighting in Europe. They're fighting all the way in India and on pretty much every ocean in the world. So the British Army and Navy is stretched pretty thin. So the British government wants to end the war in North America as quickly as possible to get these veteran soldiers out of here and send them over to what they see as more valuable colonies like the Caribbean, and also back to Europe to protect the homeland and also to fight the French and the Spanish and the Dutch. So through a whole bunch of different uh, letters back and forth between the ex-royal governors of the southern colonies, they get persuaded that there is a huge loyalist population here in the south. Americans loyal to the king, willing to fight back. All they need is a British army to rally around and they will fight for their king. So enough of these letters get sent to London and persuade enough politicians that this is the best policy. They're going to invade the southern colonies, capture Georgia, then South Carolina, then North Carolina, turn north into Virginia and cutting the colonies in half, and capture Washington and the Continental Army between an army from the north and an army from the south. And once they, George Washington is defeated, they can turn the war over to the loyalist forces here in North America, take all the British regulars out and ship them everywhere else. So the politicians in London come up with this idea, which was eventually be called the Southern Strategy, and they send those orders over to General Lincoln, or Clinton, excuse me, a uh, commander of the British Army here in North America, who's up in the New York area at this point. So by 17, end of 1779, the British has actually recaptured Georgia. And they have repelled a combined French and American army that tries to retake the colony. They're defeated and retreats back into South Carolina. So now the British have a foothold in the South. They can now bring more soldiers down and start that invasion turning into South Carolina. So by 1780, uh, General Clinton has loaded the majority of the British Army onto ships and sailed them down to the coast where Charleston, the capital of South Carolina is. He lands just south of there, he marches, surrounds Charleston, besieges us, and by the end of May 1780, they have captured Charleston, the capital, of South Carolina, and they have captured the entire Continental Army of the South that was within Charleston. Now again, this is a broad summary, there's a lot of details I'm skipping out, so we're just getting closer and closer to what's happening here in the backcountry of South Carolina. So once they have captured Charleston, again, which is right here, oops, sorry, right here, and we are right here on the map, we'll lift it up for everybody to kind of see that, Charleston's down here, we are right here on the map. British have captured Charleston. General Clinton has loaded up about half his army and went back to New York to deal with George Washington, leaving the Southern Army of the British Army here in the South under command of General Cornwallis. Now, before Cornwallis can turn north into North Carolina, he has to subdue the population and make sure no one is left in his rear to attack him in the backcountry of South Carolina. Now, in 1780, everything pretty much 50 miles from the coast, east, or excuse me, west, was considered the back country of South Carolina. This is where the majority of the free white population was. On the coastal areas, mostly those large rice plantations you think about 
uh, during the colonial times. If you think plantation, think gone with the wind, big houses, hundreds of enslaved people, that is mostly centered in those rice plantations along the coast. Here in the back country of South Carolina, it's mostly free white yeoman farmers, small homesteads spread out in different areas. A few enslaved people, the majority of the population is white here in the back country. This is also where the majority of the fighting force will be for both sides. So with the British, they want to join, get the loyalist population to join them. The patriots want the population to stay on their side. So now the people of the back country of South Carolina are facing these questions of loyalty. Are they going to join with the British? Because at this point, it looks like they're now winning. They just captured south the capital. They wiped out a southern army of the Patriots, the Continental Army. It looks like the British are winning. So that's a pretty strong point for men to join with the Loyalist cause. Or are they going to rebel, continue that fight, resisting against that British occupation? Or are they going to say, try to stay neutral, stay out of the fight? Wait to see who's going to win and then hop on to that side. So it's actually many historians, it's kind of hard to pinpoint it, but there's this common breakdown. About a third of the population were loyalists, a third patriot, a third were neutral. It's kind of hard to say 100%, but that's a good rough cut of the population. And that neutral population is shifting back and forth. Sometimes they're loyalists, sometimes they're patriots. So in order to either gather loyalist support or also to control the patriot population in that country, General Cornwallis is setting up garrisons, strong points where you can gather troops to subdue the population or also gathering point for those loyalists. In this area of the back country is a place called 96. That is the main British garrison, about 40 miles south of here, National Park today. Then it was a village with a stockade. The British army arrives, they build a star fort and they reinforce the walls, they stick in British troops there, and that now they're there to control the population. Now, we are just about 40 miles away from 96. The main crossing point of the Enderry River, which is just down the hill right here, you can see the river since it's flooded really nicely now. It's usually not this close. Uh, today, if you look straight behind me, imagine all the trees are gone, Highway 56 Bridge is right there. In 1780, that bridge was not there, that was the main River Ford of the Enery River. This was pretty much the only place you could cross with a wagon across the Enery River. There's smaller fords upstream and downstream you get on foot or on horseback, but to get a wagon across, you had to cross on the edge here of Edward Musgrove's property. So, one of the reasons that the battle was fought here, because the importance of Edward Musgrove's property where we're standing right now, was the main crossing point of the Enery River was right here. So the British loyalists Militia gathered here to guard the river fords. So by August of 1780, there was 200 loyalist militiamen encamped around the property right here. So since there was 200 loyalists, many people think that Edward Musgrove must have been a loyalist. The fact is, we don't know 100% which side he joined, but it seems like he stayed neutral throughout the war. If you go inside the visitor center, there's a quote from a letter from him on the wall. It kind of shows that he's staying neutral. But if you read the rest of that letter that's not on the wall, it seems that he's kind of leaning towards the Patriot cause a little bit. But his brother and several of his nephews were prominent loyalists. So it's hard to say 100% which side he was going for. But when 200 armed men show up on your front door and say, we're staying here, you're gonna say, what can I get for you? Uh, and that's one of the main reasons they're here. They chose this property because of the river ford here. Another reason they chose the property here was straight down the hill right here along the Henry River was where his grist mill was. That's why it's Musgrove's Mill, because he used to own a grist mill here. And if you've ever marched around in the heat of South Carolina in the summertime all day long, you get pretty hungry. That's the same idea for the British Army. Soldiers get hungry when they march, so you have to have a grist mill where you grind your corn and your wheat to take that raw material to <coughs> something edible. They had to feed your troops, so you had to control the grist mills. There's actually a lot of fighting done around grist mills during the Revolutionary War because both sides want to control the food supply. So two main reasons that the British are here, the Loyalist Militia, they're guarding the grist mill here, they're guarding the river ports. So 200 Loyalist militiamen encamped here. Also, there's some fighting in July of 1780 between Patriots and Loyalist forces, and so there's some wounded from those fightings that have been brought here, and a local Loyalist doctor is actually taking care of those wounded either in the house or in a temporary encampment around the house that used to sit right in front of the visitor sitting here. 
So those 200 loyalists are now guarding those wounded men while also guarding the river ford and the grist mill. Two main differences. We have a musket that we'll be firing. Who's, who's carrying a musket? You're always ready to go through. That's the brown bass, right? This is a King's Arm second model brown bass 75 caliber musket. Uh, American colony populated with farmers, uh, settlers, and you know, different things like that. A lot of them, this is all they had. They had a firearm that was a rifle. Got rifling in the barrel, so the ball comes out spinning like a football. That musket, maximum range of 100 yards, effective killing range 50 and under. This can have a killing range of 400. So you say, well, why didn't everybody have a rifle? It takes, I think it fires three, maybe four shots out of a musket a minute. He gets one off. So as he's loading, they're firing four times at him, and then they're pushing that band and coming after him. So very exposed. So that's, that's some of the major differences. So what we're going to do here is go through the, uh, they're going to go through the, what's called the manual the or the priming, the loading, the firing of the weapons. Loader, secure, fire lock. Right about face. Prime and load. Folks, when you hear me say fire, I want to cover your ears. He'll, he'll give you the signal. Get it. Make ready. Freeze that. Give fire. Make ready, present, give, fire. And work our way. We did it this morning, same thing. Obviously. So go to all of the things, but it's okay. I'll just show them to you on my way out. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up the video about the Living History Day at the Battle of. 
Musgrove Mill State Historic Site. I personally thought that it was good. We got there right at 10 a.m. whenever they were opening up and it is currently 3 24 p.m. so we almost stayed all day because it was running from 10 to 4 and that was on Saturday and Sunday it's April 29th and 30th of 2023 so if you haven't watched this video five years from now that's when this was done so how did you enjoy it it was real good if you love history oh I you come see it yes from my understanding it's always the last complete weekend in April and I know from years past that's when it's always been held so if you can't come this year come another time suicide next year yeah and we watched all the firings of the guns and stuff that was really interesting i originally only planned to stay to 12 but then i read there was going to be a mounted horse <laughs> so i was like well we'll stay to 1 30 and see that well then they said there was going to be a lecture about the battle of musgrove mill so i decided well we'll stay for that too that turned into be a 50 minutes i've only recorded a little bit of that for you well hopefully if you like history you listen to it and well you obviously have to like history if you're still watching the video at this point because i know it's rather lengthy so i personally had a good time glad we came today it was five dollars per person to get in that's not really bad if you think about it so i i would encourage you to come if you like history so that's gonna do it for this one if you like the video please subscribe if you haven't done so already you can like comment share and if none of that makes you happy don't worry about a thing i just said so we'll see you somewhere else i don't know where at yet but it'll be somewhere so Toodaloo.